Sounds of the real sounds of Africa there. Once again, with football fan to kick off our world football phone. And if you'd like to join us, pick up the phone and give us a call. 0808 is the number to call. 0808 You can text us on 85058. Email night at bbc.co.uk. And this morning, we're talking football in Europe, South America, and we're talking the Women's European Championships on Sunday. So we're joined by Jen O'Neill, editor of the women's football magazine, She Kicks. Jen, good morning. Good morning. Really good to speak to you. Um, is it going to get the coverage that we expect it should? Um, well, we're not biased, are we? But maybe if the BBC had it, it might have had slightly better in, in the UK. But um, Eurosport will cover it. And I think they're saying 165 million viewers they're expecting. That's the projected and if Germany do well, it'll be up to 180. I don't know how they can count <laughs> well, this. It's dependent upon Germany. Up. Hang on, dependent upon Germany. Why? Because they have huge figures. Um, and actually, in France, if the French team do well as as is expected, then they have uh, big viewing figures as well. But it's it's going all around the world. The North Americans are going big for for watching it and making it accessible for people to watch. So uh, it's it's going to be uh, pretty exciting, and hopefully, people can can get involved in that and enjoy it. Listen, I don't want to introduce the other guys because I'm having such a great time speaking to you. But <laughs> alas, alas, I must... Uh, I've asked them to stay up as well, you see. So um, just bear with me, Jane. We'll come back to you in a moment, but let's just, for the purposes of paying the rent, introduce everybody to the Galatasaray's Paul Serres. Good morning, Paul. Good morning, good morning, good morning. I'm front and centre this morning with a, a pen and a, and a pad ready to uh, to douse myself in Jen's knowledge. I'm, I'm excited about the Women's Euro starting this week, and I have to admit, I'm, I'm relatively new to the to the women's game. Um, but uh, what I've seen this last season in the spring series of the, the WSL was uh, was incredibly impressive. And you know, we've we've got a situation now in in England where we're beginning to export talent to the the more established leagues around the world, rather than um, you know others coming just here rather than it just being a, a one-way thing so uh, you know Jen spoke about whether that if the Germany team is successful and in France too I think that uh, this is probably the the major tournament that uh, on the back of the successes of the Lionesses last time round I think this is the tournament that will see uh, women's football really kicked into the mainstream in this country I certainly hope so anyway. Tim before I introduce you did you come with a prepared statement as well? <laughs> That was completely off the cuff, <laughs> Don, I'll, I'll have you know. <laughs> God, the legendino Tim Vickery is in Rio, hopefully with only a couple of sentences to add to that. <laughs> yeah, and uh, a, cu a couple of sentences to, to blow smoke up your proverbial, Don, if you'll allow me to. Welcome back, big man. We had a great time with, uh, with uh, big Seth, uh, the great Seth, last oh, week. Hey, the um, great Seth it's, not, it's, not, a... it's not the same without you. Let me just and, say, uh, welcome the, back. the great Seth is a bigger man than me, OK? Let's just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> Big man indeed. So we're you're, talking. You're a hard man to praise, you know. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so Tim's taking care of any questions on South American football. Paul's taking care of any questions on European football, and Jen's taking care of any questions on women's football and the women's European Championships, which kick off on Sunday. And gentlemen, we really have to be grateful to Jen because she's staying up for us, and then she's flying out to the Netherlands in the morning mm. to cover the tournament. Well, it is the morning already, isn't it? Well, yeah, exactly. yeah, that's, that's exactly. a very good point. I like to think <laughs> it's so early, it's still night. But, yeah, fair point. OK, so we should all be grateful to her in any case. She's going to be flying out in a few hours' time. 0808 I'm sure there are lots of questions for you, Jen, on um, the particularly Women's European Championships. And you, you can join in all the other conversations as well, of course. In fact, this one is a good one to kick off with. I thought this was a really, really good question from one of our listeners who describes himself uh, as a long-term listener. Uh, but in this respect, he says, this is Jack, who is a student at Keele University, or he was a student at Keele University, and uh, he's been a keen listener of the podcast uh, during those three years of university life. Anyway, he says podcast because I've unfortunately never had the opportunity to listen to the show live as my university social life got in the way. 
<laughs> that's yeah. Sure enough. Yeah, that is actually. Uh, his hey, his must, name's must Jack, and he <laughs> should be sent to the back of the Greta Garbo School for for wayward well, boys and girls. Before you say that, before you <laughs> say <laughs> that, <laughs> he's just finished, and today. Uh, he admits he was partying when the show was on live. But he says today he graduated with a two-one BA honours yeah, yeah. in. You don't need to Happy say honours, and also you don't need to say honours anymore because there are no more polytechnics. But he says a BA honours in human geography and business management. And what did you get for your degree, Tim? <laughs> Uh, I got a, a two one. Um, two one. I, I, I never understood that that honours thing. Either. <laughs> never. No, I, I never, never understood what that meant. Never so so. Uh, Paul, what did you get? Two one as well. What, am one. I the only two but, two in the house? No, <laughs> no, no, hang on. I've yeah. put my hand up. Oh, you've got two two as well. I, okay. I went to Oxford well, you... and uh, I got a bit diverted by um, things outside of studying. But I have to say that Desmond Tutu actually waved exactly. at me while I was working at my desk. <laughs> it was like the only time, and in honour of the great man. You got, you got a Desmond. You got a Desmond. I will I tell you. I can, told can, I, can I just point out that no one apart from you has ever asked me anything about it after I left. What did you get? It, 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 it has been, in terms of what I've done, absolutely irrelevant. So, just you know, for, for some of those people who are stressing themselves out, or perhaps who haven't got the result that that uh, uh, that they were hoping for, it really isn't the be end, the, the be all and end all. Really isn't. Look, I only brought it up because Jack mentioned it in his email, OK? So give me, give me a squeeze now or a bly or whatever you want. Give me a break, for goodness <laughs> sake. And by the way, I haven't forgotten that Jen got a Desmond, but at <laughs> least she got that Desmond from Oxford, whereas you lot... You lot didn't even get to Oxford, OK? So a Desmond at Oxford is the equivalent of a first... Oxbridge? Oxbridge, exactly, what a strange whatever. place to build a university. <laughs> on a bridge, of course it is. Yeah. But, you know, this is a true story, and I'm, I might have mentioned this on air before. True story, Jim. Um, I once had to interview uh, Desmond Tutu on a platform in front of, like, an audience of 600, and I said to him, do you realise that your name has gone down <laughs> in university <laughs> legend as a degree. And I told him, and the audience laughed. He didn't find it funny at all. Maybe that's like, why he waved at me. <laughs> he, he did literally walk past my window and waved at me twice. I mean, I think it's, a, it's one of the greatest moments of my life. Listen, a Desmond's better than a Douglas, yeah? I thought it was her, a third. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> I won't say. Depends, now, what, <laughs> depends what part of the country you come from, doesn't it, Jen? <laughs> it does, it does. Jen, did anybody say that this was a football phone into you? <laughs> I've heard you lot before. Ah, oh, right. Well done, you. Anyway, this is a question. We'll get there eventually from Jack. It's a great question, actually. He says, as a recent graduate from a university, I wanted to theoretically create a world football university in my head. And my question to you guys is which players and managers in your respective disciplines and regions would you include in this university and why? Now, I suspect it's players and managers that you think are particularly intelligent in the way they approach the game. Uh, Jen, do you want to kick off first? Um, I would say straight off, it would have to be a manager and it would be, have to be Emma Hayes. She's got the gift of the gab. She likes to learn. She's the, the Chelsea coach. Um, okay. She's well-travelled. She speaks a couple of languages. Um, and, you know, she's all about the, the learning, I think. Um, and she's got the personality to really inspire. Her players absolutely love her. And she comes out with some gobbledygook and coaching talk sometimes, but they absolutely adore her for would that. You, would you say she's the female equivalent of, let's say, Arsene Wenger, who was always known as the professor, a very sort of uh, erudite and uh, theoretical man? I don't want to come across as... Um, offensive to Emma but I wouldn't say that she was that sort of um you know sort of quiet and and um contemplative she's very out there and has her ideas and uh, can articulate them very well what about in Europe Paul sorry sorry Jen no it's okay in Europe Paul who would be the players or managers that had a little bit of intelligence around them well, I mean, I, I would say Jan Cruyff would be the would be would be the first one that popped into my mind. But the question from Jack was: it, it's a world football university, so I think probably the only person fit for the job is a, a gentleman, a German goalkeeper named Lutz Fannenstiel. 
You might have heard of Lutz. He's, uh, he's in his mid-40s now, but uh, he's the only professional player in the history of the game to play on six continents. He played for something like 50 clubs over a, a, a 25-year goalkeeping career. Spent 101 days in prison in Singapore for match fixing back in oh, back God. in the, back in the, whenever whenever he was over there. But uh, just a few uh, a few of the uh, the teams that he played for. He played for Penang. Uh, he played for Wimbledon. Orlando Pirates in South Africa. He played for Dunedin Technical in New Zealand. He's played all over the world and coached as well. And uh, and now he makes his living um, in the media. Actually, he's a, a commentator, and uh, he works for BBC World. In fact, as a as an expert, football expert. And so, Tim, uh, Tim, can you uh, offer somebody from South America? Can he call that? Oh, no. Well, not perhaps in in quite so many numbers, but he's getting close to the world record for the number of transfers. That's the Uruguayan Sebastian Abril. Uh, El Loco mm. Abril. You might remember him from that game against Ghana in the 2010 World Cup. He finished it with a little cheeky kind of Panenka penalty. And he's going to be my professor in charge of the geography department because and he's been all over, all over. Uh, he's just made, I think it's his 25th move to, uh, to a club in Chile. Um, so he, he's, he compiles the, uh, the geographic knowledge. In charge of our philosophy department, is uh, we've got two professors there. We've got uh, Cesar Luis Minotti and Jorge Valdano, um, both from that, that school of Argentine pavement cafe intellectual. Minotti I love, I can listen to all day. Um, you know, people will say things like to him, like, you know, so and so, he speaks seven languages, and Minotti will say, but does he have anything interesting to say in any of them? Uh, and so that, <laughs> that's a good question. Brilliant. So that, 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 uh, that, that makes him the, the chair of my philosophy department. Uh, and uh, also, another mention for Arsene, I think Arsene, Arsene Wenger would have to be the chair of our economics department because he, 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 he makes a club that's, that's you know, moved stadiums turn a profit. Uh, and that, that's that's very very rare, isn't it? So uh, I think he he gets a place as well. I, th- I thought it was uh, Eric Cantona that would be the head of the philosophy department, or perhaps literature <laughs> department, or perhaps drama school head. Or I don't know what he is. Yeah, nowadays. drama. I drama. Think he, he, okay. He'll be drama. <laughs> There'll be. Do, the, sorry, mm-hmm. Jen. Do I get a chip in with another one? Since Please, I yeah. didn't have as long as everybody else to think about. Well, it. yeah. Thanks to Paul's <laughs> long opening statement, we've Here had we to curtail the rest of the show. <laughs> Well, it just occurred to me that most of the US women's national team are all well brainy and some of because they've been through university as part of their, their development as players. But actually Birgit Prinz, who's um, several times FIFA Women's Player of the Year, Ooh. is now working in terms of psychology and um, has carried on her studies and, and is working with FIFA on mental health in football a- across men's and women's football. So I guess uh, she's a, the, a thinking um, woman's footballer. She was a fantastic and powerful forward, but um, very quiet and thoughtful off the field. Who did she play for? <sighs> Who did she play for? Um, she played at Frankfurt for a long time, but obviously she was the, 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 the big star for Germany for, for so many years in the uh, World Cup win in 2003, and then all of their Euros triumphs as well. Yeah, well, she I'll, works I'll, at Hoffenheim now, actually, with the men's club as well as the women's. I'd have gone for Franz Beckenbauer myself. Uh, mm-hmm. Daz in Preston, though, has some uh, contribution to the program. Daz, good morning. Morning, you're right. Yeah, very well. Thanks so much. Yeah, ahead, yeah thanks, for, thanks for being so kind. A few weeks ago, we were on the for the first time. Oh, wow, just a yeah. very, quick, very quick one. Can I suggest Stuart Baxter for the for the World Football University as well? Stuart Baxter, which who's Stuart Baxter? Stuart Baxter is a gentleman who used to manage in Scandinavia, in Japan, and uh, has managed in South Africa for the last couple of years. Uh, he's, a, he's a Scottish-born gentleman uh, who's managed all over the world, and he's very, he's very well thought of by Mr Wenger as well. OK. Uh, yeah, yeah, he was well recommended for... You know, there was even talk of him becoming an assistant manager of Arsenal at one point. And uh, you- so... Th- did, does anybody else know about him? Um, Jen, do you know about him? Stuart no, that, could you hear the sound of me tapping him into Google there? No, 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 I couldn't <laughs> hear that sound. Paul, do, Paul do, you, do you know anything about him? I do, from, from his time in, um, in Turkey. He was in Turkey a couple of years ago with a club from Ankara called uh, Genç Lebeli, but uh, he didn't last very long. He was also a, a mem- uh, manager of the, the Finnish national team. He um, was, going, yeah. Going back a few years, yeah. Uh, he's another yeah. who's had a... I mean, he's worked in Japan, he's worked in South Africa, he's worked all over. Um, you find lots of, lots of uh, people bemoaning the fact that uh, Brits never go abroad to play their football, certainly the, the men anyway. But um, 
you get guys like uh, like Stuart Baxter that sort of pop up all over the place, and uh, I suppose he had a, a, a journeyman career, but uh, but yeah, very well respected coach who's who's worked all over and has just taken over national team of South Africa. Yeah, well done for yeah. throwing him into the mix as well, Daz. Really appreciate that. Mm. Well, super. My, my, my main question is for Tim Vickery, mainly this one. Yeah. Uh, it concerned the general. I just recently read up about him uh, called Carlos Kaiser, uh, who's been described hmm. as the greatest, the greatest footballer never to play football. Hmm. Um, and it's, it's basically, no, 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 I, want, I want Tim really to kind of like, you know, if there's any mythology to dismantle it. The, the backstory from what I've read is that, that Carlos Kaiser. Uh, ingratiated himself with, with, with well-known footballers, got himself contracts at clubs, rocked up, said he was injured, got an injury, uh, made ex- manufactured excuses not to get onto the pitch, uh, including once getting himself sent off deliberately by inciting, a, you know, inciting the crowd who were, who were chanting things against the coach. Um, and, and sort of manufactured a career for himself as a, as a footballer who never played football over a number of years. Uh, and there's a, there's a film coming out about him next year. So I just really wanted to uh, pick Tim Vickery's brains about him because he must know more about him than, than I ever would. Yeah, it's a fantastic story, uh, and uh, I'm very optimistic about this film. Uh, I think that, that the film is uh, is, is going to be... I know the people who were doing it. I've, I've had a chat with them before the, the project started and when they were filming over here, and uh, I th- there's such a great story to be told. And it, it's exactly that. And he, he was the mate of of, uh, of footballers, and, and he would... So when a, when a high-profile footballer who was a mate signed a contract with uh, yeah. a Rio club... Uh, he would he would get his mate to say you know can you give can you give my mate there Carlos can you give him a you know give him a look give him a three month contract good player and he, Carlos he was an imposing physical specimen and, and so fair enough the thing, the thing is Ted the thing I keep getting back to is the one thing he was good at was the physical aspect was it that's right that's right so the pre season training brilliant you know he's, he's looking like a star there terrific then what he does when you're getting close to the time when you've got to go onto the field he feigns a hamstring injury in those days yeah. there was no test for it so he couldn't you know <laughs> so he, he just you know spend spend uh, the, the, the other two months in the in the in the treatment room and collect his money and at the end of the three months contract would be ripped up and uh, you know he'd, 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 he'd wander away and this was an age before the internet so no one could really check on on, on this so he did it again and again and again and the story about when he when he actually uh, uh, when he got himself sent off he'd just been signed I think by Bangal club on the on the yeah. outskirts of Rio he'd just been signed and, and they put him on the bench but there was no way that he was going to play there was no way it was said to him look you know, we know you're not ready you, 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 so you're not going to play we're just putting you on the bench you know because we've just signed you in the papers and so on and uh, so uh, the, 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 the side we're, we're losing the side banger we're losing they were doing really really badly they went 2-0 down didn't they or something like that that's right yeah so, so he's, some, the coach suddenly turns to him and said right, warm up you're going on so I was thinking, blimey, what on earth is going on? What on earth am I going to do now? I'm going to have to, I'm going to, have to go on. So uh, he's, he's warming up. And what do you, you know, it, it's, it's an old rickety stadium, one of those with the uh, small capacity fans close to the pitch. So he manages to get in a, into a fight with the fans so he can get sent off without having to come on. It's absolutely brilliant. But there is, and this is, this is a, a side of the story that I don't, I don't know much about. And I'm hoping the film is going to shed light because he, he was bought by a team in in France, in Corsica, Acacio. Uh, apologies yeah. if, if, if I pronounced that one wrong. And he did actually play there. Uh, I've never seen any evidence of it, but so, but he, he did play, and that, that's a reasonable level of football. I think it was French second division at, at yeah. the time. So he can't have been a complete idiot on the field, but really, on his priority was, uh, you know, getting the easy money and going to all the parties. Uh, and uh, it's 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 going to be it's going to be an absolutely fabulous film. I, I can't wait. Uh, and yeah, uh, just while we're on the always, subject of on, of, of the university out. professors, how about uh, Gerson from you know who was Brazil's past master in the 1970 past master, Jen? Sorry, in the 1970 team. How about Gerson as the professor in charge of smoking a ciggy behind the bike sheds? 
<laughs> yeah, you've got to have a professor in charge of that. Yeah, department. no, 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 <laughs> we can't have that. And Daz, thanks a lot for the call, by the way. We've had some others though for the um, university footballers, intelligent footballers. Niall in St Albans says uh, Niels Bohr, the Nobel mm-hmm. Prize-winning physicist, played as a goalie. His brother, Did he? Ha- apparently, blimey, and didn't his, know that. His brother Harold. No, not that Harold. That was in 1066. His brother Harold won an Olympic silver in football and was a maths professor. Ah, pointy ended, did you see? I yeah. didn't, didn't know yeah, that. I didn't know that either. I knew about, I knew about Albert Camus. Well, this is why Richard in, Belsize, Richard in Belsize is coming to that. And nobody's even mentioned the Pope yet. Uh, Richard in <laughs> Belsize says the man who <laughs> takes the biscuit here is Albert Camus, as, mm. uh, as Vickery says. I call him Albert Camus. Uh, winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature. You're so suave. Of course yeah. I am. And We're that's a French word as well. So uh, d- don't ask me what voulez-vous que je avec moi ce soir means, OK? <laughs> Just don't ask me that because I'm not that good at French. I never found that in my... No, I never found it in, in my <laughs> phrase book at all. Uh, Richard and Bell... Not in those days. It probably is in now, though. Richard no. and Bell... So, it's not. It's still not in there. It's still not in there. I okay, no, no. Richard... I, I don't remember... I don't remember my professor Lafayette doing any of that you know, during the French lessons. Good, do you? Yeah. No, I don't remember. Remember that at all? Uh, <laughs> à la bibliothèque. Écoutez, répétez, s'il vous plaît. That's anyway, it. That's, the, it. that's the same one that I had. Yeah, the Jean Claude <laughs> and Mary France. There wasn't any voulez-vous coucher avec moi. Not at all. Or je t'aime moi non plus. There was none of that either. Well, I'm, maybe, maybe that was a Swedish version. <laughs> <laughs> for four, four years, I've been doing the show, and I think we finally got round to offending everybody in the world. <laughs> well, yeah. so, not quite. Not quite. Take that long. The, the Nigerians have gotten away with it so far, but we'll get to them eventually. <laughs> and of course, you have to declare an interest when we start talking about Nigerians, don't you? I mean, Richard in Belsize says the man who takes a biscuit here is Albert Camus, uh, winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature and goalkeeper for uh, Racing, which is uh, University of Algiers team, I think. Or Racing University of Algiers is the team. OK, uh, you're, you're getting the sense of this now, aren't you, Jen? Kim in five says you've got one of the best people for information on the women's game in Europe on tonight. The superb Jen O'Neill. Please give her magazine, She Kicks, a mention. One of the many women pushing our game forward. Ask her how many teams from the UK will make the quarterfinals. And don't forget, some women in these... In, oh, in, the, in these uni sides, Dutton? Ask Jen about her ultimate Euros tournament mixtape from her magazine. Some tunes... Tunes, she says, selected by a player from each team in each group. OK, let's talk about that then. What the, who, who was the best selector in the Euros tournament mixtape for you, John? Well, well terrifyingly, it just shows me how bloody old I am because I'd only heard of some of them. Um, it's, it, was a, it was a difficult one. Um, I think some are a little bit um, maybe predictable. The Russians went for um, ACDC and Kasabian tracks. Uh. Back in black, so I can't complain about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then other ones were coming up with, I mean, the Icelandic one, I couldn't even pronounce to you. So that's not going to help. Uh, okay. DJ Raspberry or something yeah, um, no, is, no, is one no. of their players. I can't anyway, help you out there. Uh, so, yeah, I can, I can list them all. I can put them on the internet, but none of them really are going to be on, on my playlist, sadly. Not yet, anyway. Yeah, Re- yeah. Rita Ora, your song was the English choice. Oh, that's choice. better. That's better. That was that's English some, choice. Yeah, that's, uh, that's something that we can uh, relate to. Um, so the, there was no Bill Haley in the comments then. <laughs> no, sadly. You, see, you thought you were younger. old. You thought you were old, did you? <laughs> but this is the thing, isn't it? It's that old sort of middle of the road that um, male footballers listen to because they're sort of influenced by older players in the in the dressing room. But this lot, this women's lot. They're out there. They're already listening to, to stuff and um, making their own opinions. Middle of the road, uh, male players, uh, Paul, is Jen right? Does she have a point there? Because I always thought they were listening to punk rock or something like that. To G-Man. Punk rock? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. I think, well, I think uh, Jen's right, but uh, I think it all depends on, on the dressing room and, and who has control of the, 
of the stereo in in the dressing room pre-game. I think you get a lot of sort of Hang modern. On. Don't they all come in wearing their headphones nowadays? You see them loping off the bus with their own sort of. Dr. Dre's beats. Other headphones are, of course, available, especially the ones I get. He's hoping for a freebie. Well, no, no, no. You, you know I was a good friend of Dr. Dre's. I can get my freebies when I want to. But I'm, but I'm on the £10 supermarket ones at the moment. But but um, so is it because, you know, you always remember Psycho listening to, to punk rock music, yeah, Tim. Yeah, true. You know? no, he was an exception. Oh, that's exception. why that was news, because he was the only one. So Jamie's yeah. right, they listen to Frank Sinatra and that kind of thing, do they? I think it's changed, hasn't it, probably, now they have their own sort of devices, but it did always seem to be weird when they were asked what their favourite tracks were, and mm. they're sort of 21 and coming up with something that your sort of granddad would listen yeah. to. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, we'll I, think, I think, the you know, the, the 70% of why they're all wearing headphones, Don, is to avoid... You know, conversing with people like me and you on the way into yeah. football stadiums, yeah. I think. Well, so. Yeah, but why not? Why not? <laughs> We're talking about the Women's European Championships, which kick off on Sunday. We've got Jen O'Neill with us, who's the editor of the women's football magazine She Kicks. We've got the legendino Tim Vickery with us, answering any questions you might have on South American football from Rio. And we've got the Galatasaray's Paul Sears as well with us, answering questions on European football. You know what we're going to have to do tonight, don't you, Tim? What? Mm. What are we going to have to do tonight? Well, we can't let Jen go without a uh, a Brazilian good point, shirt good name. Good point. Good Can point. We? Well made. You know, yeah. If if Jen comes onto the program again and she doesn't have a a Brazilian shirt name, it, it'll be well unpalatable at the very least. You know, yeah, because I've said, yeah. look, the Galatasaray's is here, Paul Sears. The legendino Tim Vickery, yeah. added by Yisco or Bisquito, <laughs> some people say, <laughs> um, disrespectfully, is here back. And then Jen mm. O'Neill, you know, it doesn't sound right, yeah. does it, without a Brazilian no, shirt so, name? Do you know so. what I mean? We can't send we can't send her a we're the lass without a name, <laughs> can we? I mean, you know. <laughs> Sorry, was that was that Portuguese it's, or something? Yeah, it no. was. <laughs> it's a Nigerian bloke from Portugal <laughs> who's been to the northeast once in his life. Allowed there quickly. It was very cold. Let me tell you, <laughs> I did go once. It was very, very cold. I cried with cold. It was December. My God, I don't know how you put up with it. So before the, the before this evening is out, before this phone in is out, we will <laughs> give Jen a Brazilian shirt name. Feel free to text throughout the course of the programme, what you think her shirt name should be. Uh, you know the rules. Um, just get what you can information from her and then turn it into a Brazilian shirt name that, of course, she won't approve of, but she'll be stuck with forever and ever and ever. Uh, you can text me on 85058 or email night at bbc.co.uk. And don't forget our phone number, 0808590693. So let's talk then, first of all, about the Women's European Championships on Sunday. Who are the teams that we should keep an eye on? And what is the, um, the, the way it's set out? Is it set out in groups like the Euros, the, the men's Euros, for example? Is it a similar tournament? How different is it from that? Yeah, it's pretty much the same. I would just say on the Brazilian shirt thing, I was a number of, I was a number four for most of my career, and I was a defender who didn't get dirty. I did a lot of pointing. Okay, anyway. okay, um, okay. Th th that might help. Chat. That might inform the Brazilian shirt name, or maybe not. It's up to Fair our enough. listeners, as you know, Jen. So, so the Euros this time around, it's the first time it'll have sixteen teams competing. So that's four groups of four, uh, and then you go straight into um, quarters and semis, and then and then the final. Um, so it's not quite as awkward as the, the men's is getting with so many teams and then, um, you know, third place goes through, etc. If you, you finish in the top two, you go through. So that works out nicely. Um, we've got a couple of interesting derbies in some of the, the groups, which is all drew breath slightly when they, they made the draw. So the Netherlands and Belgium are in Group A together. It's, it's been hosted by the Dutch, just to, to re-emphasize that. But England and Scotland face up against each other. That's their opening match on Wednesday, the 19th. And Spain and Portugal are also in that group in Group D. You're asking who the favourites are, then it, it has to be Germany. They've won the last six in a row. They've actually won eight out of the last nine. Norway were the last team other than them to, to win the tournament before it came into its present format, and that was back in 1993. And they've actually beaten Norway twice in, in finals in the last sort of uh, 12 or so years. So Norway actually 
are a surprising tournament team, so we can't ever forget them. Germany are the favourites by a long chalk, but the French have the best team. They, they play with the flair and, and the talent that you would expect of a, of a, a France side, maybe earlier sort of 2000s, but they cannot seem to turn that those performances into results on the big stage. So they, they cruise through group stages and then they they just spectacularly fail when it comes to knockout matches. So so they're the, t- the big two. And then the Sweden, England, Denmark, and possibly Spain. Spain, I think, are the biggest dark horses in, in the whole tournament. Gentlemen, I'm sure you both have questions for Jen. Feel free to throw them in. Um, just let me say very quickly, we've had... Uh, one, well, we've had a few contenders for Brazilian shirt names for her, but I think this one may be out in the lead. We should have expected it. The Legendina. Yeah. 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 Uh-huh. Legendina. Yeah, we, we get it. Yeah. Oh well, do you want me to stress it one more time? <laughs> yeah, it was. It was a li- you, you were going a little bit too quickly there. I didn't manage to write all that one down. Go on, you got questions for her. Go ahead. Yeah, I have. Yeah, I mean, um, from from the what you gave us there, it, it, it seemed to me, which I think is kind of what I was ex- what what I was expecting, that traditionally, you can come up with a kind of North Europe versus South Europe divide with Northern Europe being much, much stronger than, than, than Southern Europe. Uh, we, and you, you can clearly see the kind of cultural divide. I think uh, some even economists refer to it as, as the butter-olive oil divide. And the olive oil side hasn't done very well so far. But you mentioned Spain as a, as, as a growing force. Can you, can you look at Southern Europe and see hope and progress that we might be talking about a more level playing field in the future? Yeah, absolutely. It's quite perverse, really, because Italy have been to 11 Euros or competed at 11 Euros. And in the late 80s, well, actually through the 70s and 80s, that was the country that you went to play in. If you were um, a good British player or even from uh, further afield, you'd go to Italy because they, they had this strong league. But it's the it's the culture, as you mentioned, it's the societal expectations, that machismo, that it, it just kind of repressed women's football for, for so many years across Spain, Portugal, Italy, etc. Spain have, in the last 10 years or so, really started to to invest and, and push their youth development. And in play, you can, it's, it's almost, it's cultural determinism in a sense of how, if you watch a men's team play and the, the culture of those teams in that country, then... It, it goes to follow that the women and the girls who play will play with this, the same style. Um, so we're seeing now a, a Spain team that they've done so well at UEFA level and at FIFA level at under 17 and under 19 slash 20. And they've made several finals and now we're seeing that generation come to the fore. They're investing in in the domestic league now as well, of Barcelona and Atletico Madrid, and there's rumours of Real Madrid actually starting to dip their toe. There's there's big progress being made in Spain. This is Portugal's debut, so don't expect too much from them. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it's, it is positive to see that, because for football to, to flourish and to see all of the, the best styles and players, we, we need those those teams to be doing well. And it's the same in South America. They have, they have talented players, flair players. Brazil can put a fantastic squad of 20 odd together but maybe they're not getting the backing or the resources from the federation although Rio was a bit of a a blip I guess to to really compete on the on the world stage and I suppose Paul after they've 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 fallen quite short for a while now Brazil um I I saw this clearly when I came back for the Olympics in 2012 because I I was uh, in the stadium at Wembley when they they played and lost to to Great Britain and I remember doing a thing, I, I can't remember a name, but with a, a long-established former England international uh, on, on Radio 5 before. And she was saying, I think Great Britain are going to beat Brazil. And I'm thinking, no, surely, don't have a chance. And uh, Great Britain won, and deservedly so. And whereas a few years earlier, you'd seen Brazil not only with the flair, but also with a kind of physical advantage, that had gone. Because they've, they, 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 they just stood absolutely still, absolutely still. Because of no invest, no, and you, 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 it's impossible, all but impossible, to make a living uh, at, at the game over here. We are beginning to see some positive signs. 
uh, up and down the continent. And in, in Brazil, it has th- it, it's thrived because of the size of the country and, and, and the importance of, of football to, to the local culture. So it's thrived for that reason, despite the machismo. And it was even illegal. Women's football was illegal during the military dictatorship. It just didn't happen. So, you know, when, when they, they started from a very, very low, low base. I mean, my favourite story of this is when they went to the 1996 Olympics. It's the first Olympic tournament they'd ever been to. You know the pennants that the uh, that the captains exchange before before the kickoff. They they were only given in a pennants for the three group games, because you know the the Brazilian FA assumption was you know you're going to get knocked <laughs> out you know, and, and they qualified for the semi-finals or They didn't have any more pennants to give. So uh, I remember doing a doing a radio piece on this, and the goalkeeper, she could speak a little bit of English. So she translated to the captain a kind of, you know, sorry, no have, you know, <laughs> so they could explain away that n- not, not having any penance. And I think they got the bronze medal then. And that, that had such an inspirational effect. And you began to get people coming through, Marta and so on coming through. But because there was no official backing, and, and, and it, it, it really, really kind of leveled out. And, and they got overtaken. They got close to winning world titles and Olympic titles without do, ever doing it. They haven't been close for a while. I just have the hope that things are beginning to get organised. Um, there's, uh, there's a serious uh, uh, structure now beginning to be put in place. Elsewhere in the continent, Colombia, for example, you can see the influence of the United States in Colombian society and, and, and the fact that uh, the activity is so, uh, is so known and, um, uh, amongst in, in women's football is so well known in the United States has had a kind of trickle-down effect to Colombia. So they're beginning to make progress. And maybe on the best development is uh, Comnibol, the, the South, Amer- South America's UEFA equivalent. They've recently brought in a regulation where in the future... I don't know how, how quickly they'll phase this one in, I don't really know. But uh, in order for, for clubs, you know, men's clubs, to participate in, in the international club competitions, the Libertadores and the Sudamericana, their Champions League and Europa League equivalents, in order for clubs to participate in those tournaments, they will have to have a, wo- a, woman's, a woman's side. Uh, and uh, so that, that's a really, really promising sign, although it does lead to the big question. Because if men's football runs at a loss in South America... How can the women's game be made to be viable? And that, that's a question I don't think anyone's really, really found an answer to as yet. Jen? No, it's, it's um, very positive to hear that, so that's pleasing. And I was aware of the, the league in uh, Colombia and the, that ruling because there had been um, suggestions that why weren't other confederations doing that? I mean, there's a, a big um, high-profile club in England that always gets a finger pointed at it as to why it doesn't have a women's team anymore. They play in red. They're in Manchester. Mm-hmm. Um, I think. I think. Yeah, even, it's. It's. it's uh, 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 you, you don't need to. The, it's very recent, even in Europe, that uh, female players would make any money, and that's the top-level players make any money actually from playing the game. But it, you, you, you just need the opportunity to train and the support to train, and access to facilities. And then a little bit of funding so that you can get to games. And, and, that, and women will play for the love of the game and develop because of that. So you, it, they don't need to be making money out of it, but it is a, it is a big question mark. There's, there's huge um, amounts of cash in, in football, but it is so imbalanced as to where it goes. There's some of the transfers in the Premier League of late are, are just, they're not even mind-boggling. It makes me want to stop watching. Um, it, so, yeah, we, we need to get back to about developing all levels of the game, not just the women's game. A theme is emerging with respect to Jen's Brazilian shirt name. <laughs> El Generosa. Do I need to repeat that, Paul? <laughs> no, 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 we got that one too. <laughs> you got that, we one, got too. that one too. <laughs> um, Gen- Generalissima. Ooh. Ooh. Ge- Geninho. Yeah, that's. But look, I mean, the yeah. the previous one, slight, you know, slight uh, Milit- fascist overtones. I was going to say, I don't think we know Jen that well. Yet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 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 Although we do know that she um, was never a dirty player, so we've got Jen Clinio, <laughs> and uh, yeah, there's another one, Cleonicio, Cleonicio, Clear. Anyway, look, let's get back to some of these questions. Lots of questions. You can all chip in by the way, as well. Just feel free uh, to join in the conversation as you wish. So, uh, oh, quite a few questions for Jen, I see here. This one's for you. Joss says, I'd like to ask Jen about Tony Duggan's 
recent move to Barcelona ladies. Firstly, huge kudos for her for doing something so many of the men seem too afraid to do. Secondly, do you think this is likely to benefit the England team because she'll presumably learn a lot and continue to improve or might it hamper on-pitch cohesion now that she's not playing with the same teammates at Man City? And Paul, this is where Tim requests... A request that you declare an interest, it says. <laughs> and for England, such as Jill Scott, Nikita Paris, etc. You might want to explain some of those names because I generally don't know them, Jen, so apologies. So, well, Tony Duggan. Do you know Tony Duggan? Do you recognise the name? No, I don't. Well, she's, a, she's an England player who used to play at Everton and then moved to Manchester City. And if we're talking about finance and, and support for the women's game, Manchester City are at, at the fore. And they've done that in the space of sort of three, four years to um, just giving them the facilities they play at the uh, City Academy next to the Etihad. They're getting two to 4,000 fans regularly. It doesn't sound a lot, but actually at the stage that um, the FAWSL in England does that, that's brilliant. So the, to answer the first part of the question, I think, was is it, is it a brave thing to do? Yeah, yeah exactly. It, it is a brave thing to do, absolutely. I think anybody who leaves the comfort zone to play abroad... Um, language barriers, etc. It is brave. Um, I, I think. I think people within the game expected her to make a transfer. I, I think she wasn't particularly happy at the club. Maybe she wasn't getting the chances to start. Um, didn't expect this at all. Expected her maybe to move back to Merseyside, which is where she's from. Um, and so this is a, this is a huge thing, I guess. And it got a massive amount of interest across news channels and social media. And she does have that impact because she's a, a fan favourite, and particularly younger fans like her. Um, she's a forward who tends to play on the left. Um, Barcelona did um, lose the Spanish international Jenny Hermoso to PSG. So these are Champions League teams, all just sort of finessing and having players move around. PSG beat... Barcelona in the Champions League semi-finals just this past season. Um, will it affect the cohesion with England? I'm not so sure because um, Mark Sampson, the England coach, um, he's a sort of bit of a tinkerer in the sense that he changes formations and he switches his forward line quite a lot as well. So Tony knows what her job would be there. Um, I don't think it would affect her relationship with Nikita Paris, who was a Man City forward, and Jill Scott, who's a midfielder. Um, if it was one of the defenders, it, that would have, because England and Manchester City seem to have a very settled back three or four, and it's they're the same personnel of the keeper, Bardsley, Lucy Bronze, who I, I hope you all watch and appreciate is mm. absolutely world-class. She's a left-back, sorry, right-back. Um, Steph Horton, the England captain and City captain, and, and Demi Stokes is the left-back. So they have regular... Well, they're pretty much ever present for, for England and for Manchester City. So that's a long-winded answer to your question. No, it's a, it's a good it's, answer. Uh, it's, it's, no, is Jill Scott in the dressing room? I knew. I know, I know what he's going to say. I know what he's going to say. I know what he's going to say. I knew you were going to say that. Just ignore him, James. What, did he, what was the question? <laughs> it's a musical reference oh, yeah. one, yeah. But they get mixed the, up on Twitter a lot, apparently. I, I, I don't, I'm sure that's the case. I, did, I knew what Tim's going to say. Anyway, let's bring Jay in London the into European conversation. The European Championship will be televised. It will, eventually, eventually, eventually it will. Jay, good morning. Hey, good morning, Dodden. How are you? I'm very well, thanks so much. Good to speak to you. And good to speak to you as well. Thank yeah. you. Um, so, listen, I've got, a, I've got a, a question here, but at the end of my question, I have a present for you. Oh, I, I, I've decided to give you a Brazilian shirt name tonight. Okay. How do you feel about that? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't have a problem. I've already got one, but... Uh, no, but I'm going to give you another one. I can give you a better one. I, 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 I think I a wish, better one. Uh, Jay, what? his shirt is big enough to fit two names on the back. I, I, don't I, worry I, about I, it. I was going to say, <laughs> when you give me a present... My shirt may, name, it may not be. If I, as long as I can eat this shirt, it will be a great present, okay? <laughs> oh, it'll be great. Oh, absolutely. Here we go. Future, okay, future so... reference, Jay. He prefers cheesecake, but uh, you, know, you weren't to know that. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, Here's, I'm going to ask the question first, and then um, and then and then I'll give you the shirt name. But here's so I've uh, I've just finished uh, Michael Cox's unbelievable book called The Mixer. And if you're if your guests haven't read it, if your listeners haven't read it, you really ought to go pick it up. It, it's pretty phenomenal for serious football fans. Um, probably not for your Daily Mail readers, but I, I digress. Um, but in it, I was really struck. Um, I've, I've been really struck a little bit about about. Arsen Wenger a little bit, and the amount of talent he's developed over the years. Um, 
it's my contention that he's taken, you know, okay players made them good, good players made them great, and great players made them world class, and has done it time and time again. And my question is as follows. Number one, do you think that the development of players ought to be included in the overall evaluation of a manager's legacy? In my opinion, it, it really should be. Um, you know, as much as titles are important, I'm an Arsenal fan, but I've really enjoyed watching the development of players. That's my first question. The, 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 the second okay. question to that is, who in the respective regions, which managers in the respective regions have, have developed um, have developed uh, the most amount of talent. And if you argue, well, Wenger's been there for 20 years and therefore most coaches have only been there for three or four, who in the respective regions do you think has the most aptitude for developing talent? So I, that's my, that's I, my question. I actually think the question is a really superb question. I'm going to get everybody right. to answer it and give us their opinions on it. Uh, very quickly, give me my shirt name just so that uh, we can give well, them a chance to answer it after the news. Uh, very pl- very clear. It's, it's, it should be Dutton. Dutton Adebayo biscuits. Yeah, 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 yeah. I am, I am Adebayo. I mean, is, how, how is that not obvious? No, <laughs> I am actually Adebayo. Oh, yeah, but what do they call it? Adebisquito is what they say. Well, but yeah, be yeah. Adebayo yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so very, obvious. Yeah, that is obvious. That is obvious. <laughs> it's so obvious. It's embarrassing. But I'll stick to Adebayisco or Adebisquito for now. Well, I didn't know that, but fair no, play. no, no. That's very good. That's very okay. Let's go around the table very quickly just on the first point and it's a really good point that Jay's pointing out um, we concentrate on a, man- a manager's success being judged by the amount of trophies or the fact that they can keep the team up into the Premier League rather than them being relegated and all that sort of stuff but really is that the right way to look at it Paul first well <clears throat> I mean I, I think that um, I think again we, we've got a bit of a, a disconnect between what uh, what football fans appreciate, what fans of a club, supporters of a club appreciate, um, and what the day to day reality uh, of the situation is. And um, but what you know, about we, we you see... personally? How, how do you feel personally? Should a manager? I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, I'm not looking at, at the clock as always. Should a manager be judged purely on the you know on field success, if you like, or should they be judged on the off field or training ground? improvement of their players well i think that uh, i think that most these days i think the, the issue is with arsene wenger particularly is that it's been so long without a premier league title that it's very hard to be satiated with his development of young players or the style of football that he plays ultimately there has to be results uh, and no, I know I, that I do he's get won that, more Paul. FA Cups. I than... do get that, Paul, but you are so, you're, you're twisting the night away here, as it were. Um, just on, <laughs> What do you think personally? Do you think that things are being judged in the right... Are we judging them in the right way? What, I just genuinely want your opinion. No, I'm, I'm a romantic. I, I would rather see... Maybe not rather, but I would love to see a situation where my team play six, seven, eight players that have come through the, the youth system that grew up, at, were born in the, the local area. You know, you're truly representative then of your community. Um, but uh, I also uh, appreciate that uh, managers and head coaches are employed to win. Yes, of course, the development of young players is imperative to the future of the club. But in terms of that manager's future, winning is the be all and, and the end all. And I think that, you know, every season we're seeing more and more Arsenal fans become disillusioned with the fact that Arsene Wenger is still in that, charge. But you say that, and here you've got to declare an interest. You say that your team, Manchester City, have just bought a Tottenham defender for 50 million quid, maybe 53 mm. million quid, Kyle Walker, who came from Sheffield United and mm-hmm. his play was developed at White Hart Lane. He's made them a few bob and arguably going to make you a few bob too. We'll come back to this in a, in a moment or two. It's a really good question, by the way. More on this in a moment. You're listening to a BBC Five Live podcast. If you like this, you might also like this. Eye of the Storm with Emma Barnett. Every day we're covering some sort of storm that changes people's lives forever. To find out more about our range of podcasts, click, tap or swipe. bbc.co.uk slash five live. 
Well, football phone in 08085 909 is the number to call if you'd like to join in the conversation. So it's three the hard way this morning. We're talking uh, football in South America as ever with the legendino who is in Rio. We've got the Galatasaray who is over this side answering any questions you've got on European football and players from over there playing in our leagues. And we've got Jen O'Neill, who's the editor of the women's football magazine, She Kicks, talking generally about women's football for us, but looking ahead to the women's European championships, which kick off in the Netherlands on Sunday. If you've got any questions for any of them, 08085 What about that question? We'll return to that question from Jay. And I know you're not finished with that yet, Paul, because there's a second part mm. to the question that everybody will answer as well, I hope. But just this first part of the question, where... Uh, Jay was saying, should we judge managers simply on the trophies that they win or perhaps even on their ability to keep their team in a certain league? Or are we judging them the right way? Should we not consider the way that they've improved players under their stewardship, if you like? Jen, what do you think? Well, I guess I'm a romantic as well then, because... I, I agree. I think it should be about... Isn't that what coaching is about? It's about um, mm. getting players to understand your style and also improving them. And, and sadly, modern football seems to be if a player isn't doing it, you just go shopping and get another one. And it, that just seems to sort of negate some of the the importance and um, well, what you expect from a, a top-level coach and the skills that they should be able to employ. And Tim? Yeah, with that one all the way. And so, as a fan, anyway, I want to be represented. I mean, titles, silverware, all right, it's all very well, but more than anything else, I, I want to be represented. So how the team does it, that how word, that for me is very, very important. And in terms of, of titles, no one can guarantee titles. Um, there, are, there, are, there are occasions when the opposition is better. Um, there are occasions when the luck goes against you. you know, the race is not always to the swift, to the swift nor the battle to the strong. Um, so no coach can guarantee titles, but what a coach should be able to guarantee when he comes in, he shouldn't be, be guaranteeing titles, but he should be saying, I will make this team better. I will, I will develop the team and I will develop the individual players. And uh, you would hope, because I always think, you know, some, some people think that there's a kind of contradiction between playing well and winning. I think that, that that's rubbish. I think if, if, if you want to win in the long term, the best way to do it is to concentrate on, on playing well, which means developing your players uh, and uh, developing your players in a collective context. Okay. Because that, 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 I think, is, is the key thing, the collective idea. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, who, who in South America has, has no, no, been we'll come on to that. It? I was going to come on to that in just oh. a moment. I was gonna, because uh -huh. We'll give Paul a chance to first answer in his region. And, uh, you know, to be fair to Arsene Wenger, which was Jay's prompt in this uh, question, when you looked at Nicolas and Elke, he was always fast with the ball at his feet, a little bit like Ronaldo in Brazil, I would have thought, um, initially when it came to Arsenal, Tim. And yet he became not just a, a striker, that, a centre-forward that ran fast with the ball, but one that dribbled his way around a few goalkeepers as well, I remember. He had some skills. Or, or, or Thierry Henry, how yeah, he, even, he changed even, the game even, of Thierry Henry yeah, as yeah. well. He, he, so I, think, I, think so. that's, I think that's probably a better him. example, Thierry Henry, rather yeah. than Anelka. Anelka was bought for half a million pounds, I think, on, um, you know, on incredible potential. That, that, that was clear for all to see. Thierry Henry had gone to Italy and kind of lost his way, really. He was on the periphery of the squad at Juventus. Uh, it was, uh, he went there as a winger. He, you know, it looked as though they were, they were ready. And they did. They, they wrote him off as, uh, as a player that, that just hadn't developed as they, as they would have expected. And, you know, it, this is, it's great when you buy a player like that. You bring them in, you, you change their game, and they go on to become... A club legend, but I think... Uh, what about Robert Perez? Uh, what uh, about, arguably, Dennis Bergkamp, the Iceman? What about, what about talking about an Arsenal player from the last 10 years, Dotton? This is the problem uh, that, that uh. Arsenal supporters have. You know, it's great to develop players, and Arsene Wenger is one of the best in the world at it. However, if those players, um, you know, develop under Arsene Wenger and then agitate for a move back to their former club where they couldn't get a game... This is a problem. You're, you're, you're looking at developing players for other teams, and that is the issue I think that a lot of Arsenal supporters have or have had over recent years with, with Arsene Wenger. We've got a situation now 
that maybe has, has just righted itself with Hector Bellerin, who, you know, there was talk all summer that... Uh, and this is the thing, not only do Barcelona say publicly, oh, we want our player back, but they say, oh, and we only want to pay 25 million or, or 30 million or, or whatever. And, and it seems that they, that they hold all the cards because the player's head is turned. Yeah. They want to go home, yeah. not just for footballing reasons. I mean, who would not want to leave Arsenal for Barcelona? No offence to Arsenal. I think that's a no-brainer, really. But of course, you know, I'm, well, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm standing aloof from you because I, I have to go back to North London to sleep at night. So I'm staying You're sleeping in the, you. in the in the wilds of Salford tonight, Doc. Yeah, we, exactly. we, all, we all know okay. this, so you can you can speak freely. But I mean, that's the situation. That is the situation. Fabregas, you know, Fabregas was captain at Arsenal as soon as the opportunity came to to go back to Barcelona. He wanted that to happen. It didn't really work out for him there. He's come back to England. Since then, you know, Bayerin, if they hadn't signed Semedo from Benfica, Barcelona, the right back this week, well, I mean, he, he would have been the, the, the next on the list. Uh, you know, the list is, is substantial. And this is the problem for Arsenal supporters. It's all well and good to develop players for your own team mm. who go on to become club legends. When they get to development, to, to, to almost their peak, and they want to leave, well, I'm sure that any Arsenal supporter... Uh, around would take a trophy over developing players for other teams. I think that's important. Okay, let's go around the table now. And Jen, first of all, who's the manager or coach uh, from your discipline, if you like? And it can be from your discipline or even from the men's game that you would say has best developed players over the course of their career. Well, I was just going to, on the, on the sort of previous points made, there's... If you've got five or six successful stories, do you ignore the fail rate? Do they sort of stand out from the others? If you that's a good question. If you've got like yeah, if you've got six or seven that we say are club legends, what about all of the detritus that didn't actually make it? <laughs> <laughs> and that if you're there for that word. long, well, you know, people who maybe didn't um, reach the the heights, and is it just because those five or six players were actually that talented anyway? Can you put that onto the coach? I guess that's sort of devil's advocate. Yeah, no, that's a good... I think that's a valid point, actually. In, in the women's game, it's slightly different, as you would probably expect, because we haven't really had a situation where coaches have been at a national team or a, a club where they've had the, the long time or the, the opportunity to, to develop players. It, this talent finding comes into that as well. I'm going to shout out to my old coach, Mick Mulhern at Sunderland, who actually... Uh, scoured the North East to bring in the best talent and six of the England team going to the Euros came through Sunderland's Centre of Excellence. That's good. That is good. Uh, so that, And they don't play at Sunderland anymore, as you could imagine. Quite a lot of them are, are earning money at Manchester City. So so that that was a, a big thing for, for England and for for himself to have to have been involved in that. I, I would say there's a, there's a programme that I'm impressed with, the Germans develop players and bring them through but they also do that with their coaches so Sylvia Knight stands out she's just retired she was the um, FIFA World Coach of the Year uh, last year uh, so she's been part of that for many many years and and the other guy I would say is Norio Sasaki, Sasaki who developed the Japanese team that became the World Cup winners in 2011 and, and Japanese football men's and women's is so entertaining and they've got some fantastic players. And when you say that they've developed players, Jen, what is it that they've seen in the players? Is it an attitude? Is it a physical potential? Is it a, a technical skill? Or what do you think that? What can a coach bring to develop a player? And what, how can they spot what they need to do with the player to make them better? Well, the first thing that stands out will be technical, won't it? And then. You speak to them and you work with them, and their um, ability to learn is massive. And and then ultimately it comes down to to attitude. I think that's the the big difference at the the top end of particularly the women's game now, because w w we all accept that we're behind the men's game in, in the the cutthroat world of the amount of money and the pressure that they're on are on uh, men's teams and players to succeed. And and the the playing pool, you have to be exceptional to succeed in the, in the men's game in the women's game it's all I think about mentality and you have to have that that mentality to succeed to want to get better but also to be competitive and to, to have very little self-doubt can a coach teach that they can help facilitate that but I think it, it's a it's a balance between the player's potential and the coach 
We've talked about Arsene Wenger, so don't don't go back to Arsene Wenger for your uh, on no Manchester City coaches either. By the way, Paul, who who would you go for <laughs> as being the coach that is able to spot that talent and development in Europe? Well, I mean, to to, to stay on the uh, on the the, the Germany uh, side of things, I have to go for the Hoffenheim boss Julian Nagelsmann, who's just twenty nine years old. He's the coach of the year in Germany. He, I think, probably. Um, given a, a, a huge advantage by the fact that he, he, uh, well, his career as a player ended at 20 because of a, new, a knee injury. Uh, he, he went straight into coaching. And, and in recent years, he's been at Hoffenheim, first with the under-15s, I think, and then the under-17s, and then as the assistant. So he, he's not come into a club cold. He's not had to take two or three months to, um, to, to take stock to see what, uh, what's available at, at, in different age groups within the club. He knew all of that when he took over um, and he promoted players from the under-19s into the, into the first team after Hoop Stevens was uh, unable to complete the season due to illness. And he won 7 of 14 at the end of previous season, not the last one, the one before, kept them in the league. And then last season, they, they didn't lose until the end of January. They were the last team in Europe to, to lose a game. So, you know, he has... Uh, he signed a few players, but but no huge money signings. It's it's been done with what he had, uh, and also with what he could bring through from the the under 19s and even younger than that. So uh, my my choice my choice would be Julian Nagelsmann, even if I wasn't limited by no Arsene Wenger or, or Manchester City coaches. <laughs> exactly. But just to step back, just to step back a second, yeah. um, I, I think uh, it's also important to to note in the youth development versus. Uh, trophies debate that um, coaching staff at, uh, at major clubs these days are, are so vast that, um, mm. you know, I'm not saying that Wenger, is, this is the case for Arsene Wenger, but certainly some managers will probably not get to a youth game all season. Everything's done on reports. Um, you know, if, you're, if your team are in the Champions League contesting the, the Premier League and two domestic cups, um, you know, you sometimes playing, if you're having a successful season, two games a week, you know, you're playing every midweek near enough and, uh, and, every, and every weekend. So it's not as easy as it once was, I suppose, to, th this to question, keep an eye on everything. This question is not necessarily, though, about youth development. The way I understood the question is when a player, for example, comes from another team and is parachuted in and, you know, you hear players every now and then say, oh, this manager has brought a new aspect to my game. Mm. Uh, I, I certainly remember Theo Walcott saying that about Arsene Wenger. And we keep going on about Arsene Wenger, I know. But, you know, he is the, I suppose, um, the one manager that you can point to and say, yeah, we've all seen a little bit of the improvement that maybe, he's made. Maybe not the and... one, but certainly the first, I think. The yeah. first that, uh, that sort of came in in the modern, the modern era, the and Premier League the most League enduring era. as well, the most enduring because he stayed so long. Uh, but I, I definitely remember Theo Walcott saying, coming from Southampton, saying, look, this bloke's brought another aspect to my game. But at the same time, remember Theo Walcott fell out of favour and had to find another aspect to his own game afterwards because he kept wanting to be a centre forward but you know Arsene mm. Wenger was saying no 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 you're going to stay you know just off the centre forward or whatever it might be uh, anyway just very quickly Tim um, tell us from South South American perspective because Frankie yeah, Glasgow is waiting patiently to come on pl players opinions can sometimes be a little bit um, can, can be very very subjective they, they often tend to like coaches who pick them you know if he picks me he's great you know he's had yeah. an, if, he, if he doesn't pick me what, is, what does he know he's an idiot um, well, one who stands out here, I think, is Jose Peckerman, who's now coach of Colombia, but 20 years ago he was Argentina's youth coach. And he put in a structure there, and it is a structure. It's not just one man, it's, as Paul said. It, 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 you know, it's a collective effort. He put in a structure there that revealed just a production line of fantastic players. Uh, and Uruguay have kind of carried that on. On Uruguay, a population of just over 3 million, still do very, very well. And that's based on having a, a fantastic under-20 project that they have a, a youth team project where and they're, they're teaching. It, it's based on the idea that the players are going to get sold very, very quickly. They're not going to stay in Uruguay. So at the under-20 the under level, and the under-17 level, that's where you get them for the long term. And what are they looking for in terms of, you know, that, that question that was just posed a few minutes ago, what are they looking for? Um, Uruguayan football in comparison with global football where they want their players to be and they want their players to stand out, Uruguayan football is slow. So they want their players to be quicker. 
Uh, and it, that, that's not just speed of movement, that's also speed of thought and technique, because technique is speed of technical execution. You know, if you can bring a ball up under control just like that and pass it just like that, you might not, not, not have moved particularly quickly, but you've made the ball move, uh, and that's even more important. So they're, they are the things that they're looking for, and they keep punching above their weight. They keep producing a, a, a production line of talented graduates, one of whom it looks is, uh, is, is poised to come to England, Diego Roland, of, uh, of little sinewy support striker from Bordeaux, looking, uh, he's, he's flown in, looks like he's going to join Fulham, which is a real feather in the cap of English football, I think. OK, let's bring Frank in Glasgow into the conversation. Frank, good morning. Uh, good evening, Dawson, and everyone else. Uh, as usual, the Hi. best football phone-in programme, and I'm being sick of sick of fan I know. But, uh, no, but we'll, we'll, no, we'll, we could do with a bit of that, so thank oh, you very I can, much. I can, I can give you a bit of bucket load, don't worry about that, if you're, <laughs> if you're so inclined. But um, it, the reason being it's so inclusive, it includes every, every country, Africa, America, things we've never known about, it's wonderful. Uh, I've got a quick point, um, and, and what I'm going to say might be a bit critical, um, but it's in a framework that I love the show, um, I've got a quick point about a particular French player that my beloved Celtic have signed this week from Man City, Olivier Chan. Um, mm -hmm. If Paul knows anything about him, I'd be, any in the top would be very grateful because um, he's not really played for, for City and you know we're a bit thin in the ground. But we paid a lot of money for him for Celtic, four and a half million uh, for someone who's really you know not. He played in Italy, I think, or Spain was it? I can't remember. Um, but any, any Paul could tell us would be great. And, and you were yeah. going to say something critical as well. <clears throat> Sorry. Did you not say you, you were going to say something critical? Uh, no, no, uh, after this point, if that's OK, it's okay, regarding yeah. Scottish football, okay. if that's OK, Don. OK, no problem, yeah. Go on, Paul. Yeah, Olivier and Cham, he's uh, a young midfielder, destructive defensive midfielder, capped by France from under 15, I think, all the way through to, to under 21s. Uh, I've not seen him play for City, but I have seen him play for Genoa. He's been in Genoa, at Genoa, for the last couple of seasons on loan. And... Um, no, the report at the time was was that there was an option to buy for for Genoa, but obviously they've not taken that up. So, yeah, I mean it's it's a bit of an unknown quantity to be honest, but uh, it is a lot of money. And uh, Celtic clubs north of the border don't really have a huge amount of money to to play with, so they will have scouted him extensively, I'm sure, and they will know a great deal better than than I, you know, the kind of qualities that he can bring to to Celtic next season. And well, I mean he's going to have to. He's going to have to improve, impress immediately to, to get into to a side that didn't lose all season last year. So I'm as interested as, as anyone to see how, how he's developed. And I'm not sure whether there is a, a, a buyback clause in, in, this, uh, in this sale to Celtic. So that would be, uh, I mean, a, a good indicator of, of how highly City do, do rate him. Frank, you see, that's how good this world football phoning is. You hear Paul there so eloquently say, I haven't got a clue. A good minute filled with uh, well, nothing really, but I don't mean that. Go, yeah. <laughs> I don't mean that in a bad way. Paul. No, it no, takes no, years. Of, it takes years of training to be able to do that. <laughs> of course, it does. I'd, I'd rather, I'd rather, I'd rather that than uh, you make that up the way Don makes things up in the oh, game. But oh, exactly. no. Oh, no. Now we're talking. Is, is now that, we're talking. I Frank. hope that's the critique. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't get better than that. <laughs> Here's my nasty side now coming in, uh, Don. No, we don't mind. It's two points. First of all, um, uh, you know, and it's not just uh, Five Live. Other other uh, English-based stations or, nas uh, or national stations that are based in England have the same. I would say dismissive, disrespectful, completely uninterested attitude towards Scottish football, which is completely unfair. You broadcast to the, to, to the United Kingdom, not just England. And tonight, I've listened tonight to your, to your uh, sports bulletins and the various ones, the long ones, a half hour, and the short ones, and the other. And the champions of Scotland uh, were playing the champions of Northern Ireland tonight uh, in a Champions League qualifier, not a friendly, a Champions League qualifier. And the rumour that uh, Zlatan Ibrahimovic may play for Man United again got a mention in the football department. Uh, nothing about the game. But, now, that, I'm sorry, but that's an absolute disgrace. No, Frank, I, I don't disagree with you in that respect, but uh, let, me, let me explain the parameters uh, that you will know already. I mean, apart from the fact that we are different football federations, we also have the BBC has BBC Scottish radio stations who cover that period and to a certain extent 
um, I, we don't want to take their audience away, which sometimes will happen. That if you if you if you're a fan of Scottish football or fan of Welsh football or fan of football in Northern Ireland, uh, we want to direct you to your local stations who do an excellent job. A a as you know, Roddy Forsyth joins us um, sometimes on Five Live here covering Scottish football or giving us updates and bulletins. But he is a BBC Scotland reporter, first and foremost. And that should be... That, that, that's the correct place for that commentary and coverage to be on. But, Dotton, my point here is I work nights. I listen to Five Live all through the night, right, from for 12 hours. I'm listening to Radio Scotland just now. You're on Radio Scotland. Radio Scotland don't work during the night. This is Radio Scotland I'm listening to. I know, to. Yeah, but that doesn't distract from the fact that um, Radio Scotland is still has a challenge in the daytime to make sure that listeners tune back to them rather than stick with Five Live. I but mean, don't, I, don't, I, I sleep during the day. Yeah, no, but I, I'm saying that's you, but I'm saying that genuinely, and it's the same issue for BBC London that I'm very familiar with and all local stations that take Five Live and up all night during the course of the night. But Remember, Don, sorry, inter Don, can I interrupt you? Go sorry, on, Don. Go on, go on. Don, there's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Scottish people and Northern Irish people that live in England and don't get rid of Scotland. Yeah, no. Or I, Northern Ireland. Well, you know you can get any BBC station now if you're online. If you're online, you can go to the iPlayer and get any BBC Don, radio station. Don, we're talking about people driving about in their cars here. I know. Fair enough. Fair, <laughs> fair point. That's a fair Can point. I, let me, and, let me and, just and, jump and, in a, a second here. I, I think um, I agree with Frank, but also I'm going to disagree with him in a moment as well. I agree that there should have been coverage of the, the Champions League uh, qualifiers tonight, not just uh, Linfield and, and Celtic, but across the board. I think uh, as, a, as an industry, uh, the football media is, uh, is too... Um, focused upon clickbait, transfer-based articles, who's going where, you know, when, when the football disappears, in inverted commas, because there's actually loads of football still going on in the summer. It's uh, unfortunately what drives clicks. It, it's what people want to read about. It's what people want to listen about. However, in, uh, in Northern Ireland this evening, we had a situation where Lee Griffiths was shown a yellow card for time-wasting by the referee after having coins and bottles thrown at him I know it's from mad. the home supporters. This is crazy. This is something that should be... I mean, if this was a situation where... Okay. Uh, I, I don't know. If this was Fenerbahce against Manchester United and people okay. were throwing coins and, and bottles around, this would be, this yeah. would be major news, and, and it should be news. However, this is the point where I'm going to disagree with you for, for a moment, Frank. Uh -huh. Scott, Scott's population of Scotland is roughly 10% of the of the UK. Is that is that fair? Is that about right? Yeah, 60 million. Yeah, that's correct. Yep. 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 So tell me, tell me how on a on a normal week during the season on on the two major broadcasters that show that have the rights to to show live football, we see maybe five English Premier League games a week, and we see three or four from Scotland. This is this is weighted the wrong way, in my opinion. I've got nothing well, against Scottish well, football. I enjoy watching it. It's on at different times of the day, so it doesn't clash. But but I think it's the opposite. I think that Scottish football gets an awful lot of coverage look, from the, the look, major broadcasters look, in this country. I, I'll tell you what, Frank. And, can, um, can I come in again at the end go, of the There's yeah, final point on this, because I'm going to move it on. Go on, go on. Yeah. Yeah, fair enough. Oh, yeah. Well, well you know, the, the reason, again, Dotton, is, is the, with, with the, I think that the BBC uh, in England, by the way, the easy in Scotland, and I'm going to be straight as a disgrace as well, regarding the next point I'm going to make, because... You may or may not know, and I, I would imagine you're going to say you don't know, which is which is incredible, but I'm jumping the gun here. Do you know the moment, uh, Dotton, and this is for all of you, if you, any of you have heard, the biggest financial scandal to hit not only Scottish football, but British football, is happening at the very moment now. And it was cemented and confirmed by a guilty verdict last Wednesday in the Supreme Court in London. When, when Rangers Football Club and I know I'm a Celtic fan, but this is a bit a scandal. Well, yeah, well, involving we... Involving fifth... No, no, but, Don, this no, is... No, 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 but this wait, Frank, Frank. This is not case, Don. No, 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 I know, but you know that we've covered this over when? and over again. We have well, covered it. it tell me about it, then, Don. <sighs> Look, Frank... You don't know, Don. Frank, you don't know, because you... No, Frank, I'm, 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 Frank, Don, this is for the last, Don, because... But for the last, really for the last uh, three or four or five years, we've covered the uh, Rangers... 
uh, scandal. We have covered that, and if you've been listening, then you will know that. Now, you might you might say that something's come out in court recently, but you can't say we haven't covered the story. Of course we have, and all news networks across the BBC, as far as I remember, have covered that story. Uh, maybe not as much as you would like it to be covered. Yeah, another 25 minutes of the World Football phone to go. Uh, feel free to join us on 08085909693. Uh, we've got Jen O'Neill with us, uh, a special guest this morning. Jen, are you enjoying it so far? I am, yes. Yeah. Uh, and she's the editor of the women's football magazine, She Kicks. How can we get hold of her? Jen? Sorry, how can we get a hold of whom? She kicks. All oh, right, you can if you go on Twitter and you can download our Euro preview issue uh, for free. We're that nice. My Twitter handle is at shekicks.net. Oh, that sounds fantastic. The free bit, particularly. Uh, <laughs> we've got the legendino Tim Vickery with us, um, covering anything to do with South American football and chipping in everywhere else. It seems. Uh, we've got the Galatas series, Paul Sears with us, who has already made his bid to become Director General of the BBC, <laughs> if not Prime Minister. And we've got... What, Paul... I, was, what I was going to say, I certainly don't want the second job. No, no thanks very much. Well, what you, I was going to say, John... you have if you do. At the, uh, at strong the, and stable, Paul, yeah, strong before, and stable. <laughs> keep it, keep it a... before, the, before the news was to yeah. Frank that... Um, no, no, person, no, 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 we're not getting back there. I we're want. not getting back there. We're not getting Don, back there. Don, I, I, said, I was on your side. I mean, no, and it doesn't matter which side you were on. I'm just saying we're not getting back there. I, I said thank you very much to Frank, and I said thank you very much to you. And then I suggested Ace Gentura for a Brazilian shirt name for Jen O'Neill. Ace Gentura. What do you mean? Who said terrible? Was that you, Paul? <laughs> Paul, <laughs> what are you on tonight? You I'll, are, be, I'll be honest. You, you, I'll be on, honest, Go on, go on, go on. Go on be like, honest. Whenever, whenever these, these come up, you know, potential shirt names, yeah. the suggestions are, you know, they're, they're brilliant. They're, they're way over my, my level of intellect. Yeah, but yeah. tonight they've been weak. They've been oh, weak oh, that's harsh, harsh, man. That is weak. harsh. Jen, do you mm. agree they've been weak? I, mean, given... I, think, I think some have been all right. I think I they've been get... very witty. I can't get Pierre Van Hooydonk out of my head. I know that sounds weird, but <laughs> Frank started Van talking Hoy about... Dunk. We haven't heard that. We haven't heard that tonight. Yeah, well, he started talk... uh, Frank started talking about Celtic and the fact mm. that he's the ambassador for the Euros just popped into my sad head. I always think of Nottingham Forest when I hear about Pierre Van Hooydonk and how he uh, didn't quite fulfil his commitment to them. and they don't think they've mm -hmm. forgotten it ever since. I think they got relegated that season, didn't they? Anyway, there's another couple. El Generosa. El Generosa. Did you go? Uh, <laughs> yeah. And how about definitely? This is from George. He says it's got to be definitely O'Neillma. Oh. Oh, you've perked Ooh. up suddenly, Paul. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah Neil, like Neilma, Neilma was, yeah. Uh, was a pretty good Brazilian forward, wasn't he, Tim? Yeah. For a while there. Wow. Well, and this is. Yeah, I don't see his connection with Jenna oh, O'Neill. Jen O'Neill. Jen O'Neill. We've, we've, we've all been Hi, doing I'm the Jen, Jen thing. We haven't <laughs> no, been thinking O'Neill. 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 Yes. Get it? Yes. Okay. That's the best, yeah. Yeah, I do. Yeah, and El Pointinho says Ian in Dumbling. <laughs> uh, Jenny Forza. I don't get that one. Jenny Forza. Am I missing something up? And number four. Oh, yeah, number of four. course. Very good, very good. Gosh, that's why you got 2-1, isn't it? Anyway, and Tony Liverpool... Oh, you're still bitter about that, aren't you? Of course I am. <laughs> I'm going to be it's bitter forever. 30 years ago, he hasn't forgotten. It doesn't matter. I'm not going to forget <laughs> that one in Ari. Um, this is from... Uh, it's Tony Liverpool who says, uh, as Jen is a leader... You see, somebody who actually explains what it is, and even for us uh, Desmonds to understand. <laughs> um, Jen is a leader... <laughs> <laughs> Jen, Jen is a leader, strong, clean in terms of uh, football. Number four, so Geronimo. I like that. I'm sorry. It's my sense of humour. <laughs> and what about Danielson for uh, Jen's Brazilian shirt name? Do you get Donielson? Do oh, Donielson. Yeah, Donielson it would be. Yeah, of course it would be. Yes. Uh, Steve in Birmingham yeah, has gone for. Yeah, yeah. No, good stuff. Yeah, good yeah, stuff. Not bad. Not bad. And uh, oh, Genonelia says Liam Bradford. It's a little bit too complicated for my head. In any case, <laughs> and, yeah, a bit dangerous as well. That one. <laughs> you okay. Well, don't do that one. Yeah, well, let me not go there then. Uh, and <laughs> no. oh, I've got to do this in my best Geordie accent. 
Oh gosh, here we go. It's going to come we're up. We're the lad. A booger again. <laughs> we're the lad. Now, don't come moaning to me if you can't do a Geordie accent. <laughs> <laughs> then I can't do it. I can't do it. But, Jen, anyone taking your fancy so far, Jen? Oh, I just thought that Janino was the most straightforward. Mm. But I can tell if you like one because yeah, how many times you say it. <laughs> <laughs> if you say it like three times, but but we're more interested. In, we're more interested in the ones that you like at the moment. Yeah. Well, I'll have a think. That was the. That it's was the a, easy it's one. a trap. It's yeah. a trap. Don't fall into yeah, it. What, what trap? What trap is that? <laughs> trap. <laughs> a trap. Four trap years ago, I walked into the same <laughs> trap and I've never got over it. And he said it just like the wolf in Little Red Riding Hood as well, isn't it? No. What a lovely name you have. No, it's, it's like the wolf in Bloody Chamber. I'm more in touch with my feminist side tonight. Richard the Milkman says, I learned during the week that until the FA banned them in the 1870s, the women's game was actually bigger than the men's game. I never knew that before. Is that, is that the fact, Jen? It's 1921, I think, well, round about then, that they, they imposed the ban. So it was only in the 70s that they repealed the ban and it allowed women to play on um, FA-sanctioned pitches. So, yeah, they did ban it. And there were, what, there's all these... Um, the classic game was at Goodison Park, I think, towards the end of this, the First World War, just after, it was like 50,000 in the crowd. So it really was bigger than the men's game? Oh, yeah, game. it was massive. But, yeah, but there's, there's a lot of sort of contextual sort of historical reasons for that, I guess. Um, Britain's Got Talent wasn't on the telly at the time, <laughs> that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> the masses watch now. Um, and all the men yeah, were, was, off, were off at it, war, I guess. In, yeah, yeah, uh, and that, that's the other reason. But the, and they were allowed to do a lot of other things that maybe they wouldn't have normally in terms of employment. And, but, yeah, it would have, if you think, it would have been, it would have been a lot bigger than it is now if it didn't have to play catch-up. And, and this from Nigel in West Sus Sussex, Jen. Um, who of Germany's women got to replace their legendary defender, Annika Kruncher uh, Kran? <laughs> um, well, the, I, I guess the um, onus falls on uh, Josie Henning, who was at Arsenal for a year and is now at uh, Lyon. Um, and Babette Peter, I guess, is one of the other sort of mainstays. But that's, as I mentioned, uh, Germany are favourites simply because they have they have that mentality to win. And we sort of wrote them off in 2013 and they still won it. Um, but they have had quite a few players retire, bearing another. Lauda is out injured. Uh, Alexandra Pop will be a big miss, um, midfielder forward. So, yeah, the, Germany are the favourites, but there's question marks. Kran is a big miss too, as was Nadine Angra, the goalkeeper. Uh, Michael in London's with us. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Dawson. How are you? I'm um, very, very well, thanks, for Jen. By the way, this is the Guna Samaritan. Uh, don't <laughs> ask him who he supports, but just think about Guna Samaritan. <laughs> I think we've talked about Arsene Wenger for about half of the programme tonight, Michael. Yeah, it's not a question about him. Um, declaring interest. Declaring <laughs> interest. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. Um, what? What? Um, what? My question is: um, I, I, You didn't have a European expert on last week. Was be, is be a question for Paul? Yeah. And of course, if Tim wants to chip in, um, a forty-five million Jen? pound can, plus add-ons. Can Jen chip in as, if she wants to as well? So, oh yeah, sorry, sorry, Jen. God, uh, I thought you were such a gentleman, Michael. Uh, it's the way I was brought up. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> yeah, it's forty-five million plus uh, add-ons. What can we expect for Ale from Alexandra Lacazette? Mm. Well, I mean, you know, uh, he's been brought in for goals. Um, he's been prolific in the, the last few seasons, top scorer in, in Ligue 1 until, uh, well, I mean, up there anyway with, with Zlatan when he was still at PSG and, and since he left to, to, to go to Manchester with Cavani, who had a, a renaissance season last season. He's quick, he's strong, he's, he's not the biggest, but I think that, uh, that helps his game. He's compact. I think that he's physically robust and I think he'll be well suited to the Premier League. I think almost as crucial as signing him is uh, is who Arsenal are able to keep. There's there's talk this week that uh, Ozil wants to sign a new deal, although I'm not sure Arsenal wants to pay the, the kind of money that he wants to sign that new deal. And of course, Alexis Sanchez, what happens with him? I think those as a, as a front three with supporting roles from the likes of Walcott, Giroud, if he stays... And, uh, and the others, I think that that is a potentially title-winning front three, Ozil, Sanchez and, and Lacazette. But unfortunately, 
Um, again, we spoke about this earlier, Michael, that you know, it's, it's all well and good to bring in players that are maybe on the periphery elsewhere, develop them, make them key players for your team. But then if they want to move on, you've just ended up wasting two or three years of, of your own time. And if Alexis does move on, I think you have to look at Arsenal as being weaker up front than, than they were you know, last season because Alexis is a better player than, uh, than Lacazette. He's not the same kind of player, but he provides a similar number of goals. Um, uh, and I think that if, if Sanchez leaves and Lacazette you know, comes in to essentially replace him, I think Arsenal are weaker on the whole. Jim, do you want to add anything? No, not re- with, with the Sanchez thing. I, I don't know which, which, ways, which way this is going to go. Um, and my worry with Sanchez is just the amount of football that he's playing. It's, it's now been four consecutives for end-of-season summer tournaments with, assuming Chile qualify, a fifth one coming up. Do you think, Paul, that this will make Arsene more likely to let him go at the right price? Is Lacazette coming in? Do you think that, that, does that mean it's more likely that Sanchez will go out, or do you think that the Lacazette coming in makes it more likely that Sanchez might stay because he'll be most favoured to play alongside him? I think with um, with Alexis, the things that he said, or all the questions, more to the point that he avoided when he was on the international uh, duty with, with Chile at the end of the domestic season. I think at that point it was pretty clear that he was off. Um, the thing is, it's not happened yet. And when these things tend to drag on, they, they become less and less clear, I think. I think that, um, that he and, and Lacazette would dovetail beautifully. There's real pace there. There's, there's technical ability and, and there's power as well. And I don't know. I, I think that if Arsenal are, are genuine about uh, wanting to, to fight for the Premier League title this year, they need to keep Alexis Sanchez. Absolutely need to keep him. I think you'll go, though, for the record. Uh, this is from Drew in Atlanta. Jorginho, pronounced in suitable accent, please. Oh, no, that doesn't work, does it? Oh. <laughs> that's good. That's good. That was good terrible. Now, hang on, let me try like it once it. more. Jen, Jen, don't be offended. This is a Nigerian Jordi. Jorginho? 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 <laughs> That's not bad. And actually, you haven't heard my uh, commentary on Eurosport when I pronounce Nigerian names. So even. <laughs> I can hear you say Nigerian. <laughs> no way. But, but Jordina. Can, can you make us say Costa Rica? I know. Please. You, you ask her. You ask her very nicely. You ask her very nicely. Go and ask her. Uh, by the way, the, 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 yeah, it, it's a Chris Waddle question, this one, by the way. Go on, go on, Tim. Ask her nicely. Yeah, can you can you please say the name of that that Central American country that surprised everyone by reaching the World Cup quarterfinals three years ago? I might upset and get my Oxbridge voice out. Costa Rica. <laughs> but the best the best best phrase is sweeper keeper. Sweet sweeper keeper. Yeah, very good. Sweet <laughs> the sweeper keeper from Costa Rica. <laughs> it's poetry. And Liverpool. It's poetry. Yeah. Jen, the, 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 I mean that that all came from Chris Waddle at the World Cup when uh, when Tim was enamoured by his uh, Geordie yeah. twang and saying Costa Rica. <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> and Tim forgot all about the World Cup. Was just spending the rest of the time he was on telly trying to get uh, Chris Waddle to say Costa Rica. Juvenile. Can you get, juvenile can you get antics. The can you get him to say penalty properly? That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> I love Chris Waddle. I love him. That's I a do. good question. And this is from Jeff, and I'm not going to do it in the accent, but he's gone for Stotty Keikyo. <laughs> Stotty Does he work for Greg's? I'm, I'm not sure where, which bakery he works for, but uh, <laughs> others are available, apparently. So Stotty Keikyo, do you like that? No. You don't like ah. it. Ah. <laughs> I've got a question actually, and this, this seems like a this seems like a probably a good time to uh, to 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 ask it, Jen. It seems that I mean I've I've commentated the the spring series for for Manchester City and uh, my research. Declare an interest. But, oh yeah, well, yeah. It's declared for me these days, Don. Within minutes of the start of the program, I don't need to. But uh, in my in my research, you know, Liverpool come into town and, and Birmingham and, and Bristol, one or two others. There seems to me to be um, it, the northeast of England seems to be a real hotbed for for women's football. Is there is there any is is that right? Is it true? And if so, how has it come about? What what's the emphasis in the northeast that? That the rest of the country doesn't seem to have picked up on yet. I think m- maybe it's uh, geography. They've got a sort of big conurbation, haven't they? Teesside and um, then Tyne and Weir, and then the, the hinterland of Northumberland, because Lucy Bronze is from up in mm. Annick. Um, 
I, I, it's partly because of what I mentioned about um, Sunderland were were my old team declaring interest, um, <laughs> and uh, we were sort of at, at the fore for for a lot of the late nineties and early two thousands, and and so could have the pick of the talent and then develop them and that, develop them. And I, I mentioned Mick Mulhern, and he was sort of integral in that. So the players you're talking about are Steph Houghton, who's the England captain, is from. Um, Durham, old teammate of mine, Jill Scott from Sunderland, Demi Stokes from South Shields, where I'm actually from. That's very exciting. Um, Lucy Bronze, Jordan Nobbs, vice skipper for England, is from Sedgefield, and Carly Telford's from Concert. That we've got some others coming through, Beth Mead, but there, I wouldn't say there's. It's weighed more in the favour of the North East. It's just that sort of golden generation had the opportunity and absolutely grasped it, and they had the talent as well. I think we've got a Brazilian shirt name for her, you know. This is coming from Joe in Deal. Geordie Best. That ain't bad, is it? <laughs> that is really good. Geordie Best. I'm liking there that. There we go. I'm liking that. Go. Well, it's not, it's not done deal yet. We have to find out whether she likes it or not, remember? <clears throat> Anyway, uh, let's talk about. Let's talk about. Uh, you, you've never enjoyed a quick fire round uh, yet, uh, Jen. So we're going to throw. Oh, there, oh, I forgot as well. There's the Angel, Angel of the North North Risomo, Angel of the North Risomo. Do you get it? Uh, from Jarrah, or do I have to repeat it many more times? No, 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 we, we okay. get it. Not, I'm we just get checking, it. I'm just checking, for goodness <laughs> sake. So, a uh, quick fire round, guys. Um, would you please ask Paul if he sees AC Milan challenging Juve at the top of the Italian league this season after spending a lot of money, particularly impressive, getting uh, Bonucci. Bonucci, also, Bonucci. Yeah. how about Jorginho for a Brazilian shirt name as well? Yeah, we've had quite a few of those. Thanks, uh, Danny. Uh, I can't. I cannot believe that um, that Milan have, have been able to sign Bonucci, but not just Bonucci. They've signed uh, Rodriguez from Wolfsburg, the left back. They've got the makings of a very, very fine team. I know it's a quick fire round. Um, if they can bring it all together quickly, uh, there's there's definitely an opportunity for them to, to to work their way back into the Champions League football for next season. But uh, it really bodes well to see one of the Milan sides really, you know, for the first time in a long time, be really. Um, you know that they're, they're they're grasping it. They're not buying also runs. They're not uh, they're not playing for fourth or fifth in the league or worse. That they're really going for it this year and they're ambitious okay. and it's good to see. And and Jenny, uh, what? Oh, sorry, Jen. Forgive me. Apologies. You can call me Dotty as well. By the way, uh, Rory <laughs> says, "What are England's realistic chances chances at the Euros? Can they beat the likes of France and Germany and win it for the first time?" Well, they haven't beaten France since 1974, <laughs> so um, wow. it's uh, it'd be epic if they do. I think we'll and take they, that. They as probably a no, will then. have to. Yeah. Uh, no, um, they beat Germany at the World Cup in, in 2015, so that was a, mm-hmm. a big one. Semi-finals is, uh, I think, is an absolute must, and anything less is is a, a, a massive disappointment because they've set themselves up as they're going there to win, so they've absolutely got a chance. Yes, is it going to be easy? No, because the Euros according to all the players, is harder than the World Cup because the games come uh, tougher and faster. And, and Bill wants to know, Jim, Bill in New York, what uh, can you tell us about the Ecuadorian side that Manchester City has purchased and rebranded as another satellite club with City FC in the name? Uh, it's, this is Guayaquil City, I think. Um, well, Guayaquil is, is a city in Venezuela, in Ecuador, that I've never been to. I'm desperate to go. Uh, I don't know a lot about this team. I think they're making their first first division debut now. Um, it's another one of those tentacles, and this is all about buying players and shipping them over. Just on the Manchester City thing briefly, I'm a little bit surprised to see they, uh, that they're bringing in a central midfielder from Brazil, Douglas, from Vasco da Gama. It looks like they're going to loan him out to a team in Spain first. It's exactly the same position as, as Yang Herrera, who uh, they've already bought and loaned to New York City where our friend there who sent that one in is, is from. It's two players from the same generation from the, in, in exactly the same position. Um, I can't quite see where, where, where Douglas is going to fit in because uh, of the two, no doubt about it, I think Yang Herrera is, is, is the better one. OK, and, and also, Jen, from Jack, with Chan Yun Ting and Corin Diaka, is it? Both being successful in men's football, should more clubs consider having females on their coaching management staff, do you know? 
Oh, wow. Um, I think that would uh, depend on the acceptance of the players and whether they could respect a coach. And it depends on the owners and the senior management, I guess. Um, um, the fans and media would have to have an input into that. Could they not make it such a big thing that somebody could get on with their job? The, the, they're two very good examples. Uh, Shan Yun Ting actually stood down, I think, uh, this summer because she didn't win anything with her Hong Kong side this year after winning the title last year. Um, Shelley Kerr is a good example. Just left Stirling University to take the Scotland job. She'll take over after the Euros. So I don't think we're quite ready yet, but soon. I, I don't see any reason why somebody with the experience and the nous and the ability shouldn't be able to, to coach a men's side. Shelley says it, the, the men are different to coach because they're less stress stressy. They worry less. She says that's actually quite refreshing. Mm. Amin in London says, Paul, how will, how well do you think Ennis Younal will do at Villarreal this season? Yeah, another player that uh, that came into City full of potential and and, uh, and got loan, loaned out to FC Twente in the Eredivisie last year and scored plenty of goals as well. It's a, you know very often young talent is bought up by big clubs and and they disappear. But uh, I like the way that City have dealt with Ennis Younal. They've taken him to the Eredivisie. He's done well, and uh, and this is definitely a step up from that. And I think this season, will um, will as we will learn whether he is ready for the first team come next year. And if he isn't, he probably never will be. Um, I, I would like to think that his style of play fits well with with Villarreal. Um, they're a good side. They play attacking football. While you know they've got a good balance in that team. If he plays, he'll score. He's he's one of those players that he knows where the back of the net is and. Uh, and he's clinical. So, I don't know. I mean, 12 to 15 league goals would be incredible. But, uh, you know, 8 to 10, I think, would be acceptable, depending on how much he plays, of course. Listen, let me just throw out a message very quickly to all our listeners. Uh, because you know it's pre-season time where lots of clubs head abroad for friendlies, um, often to the United States. Everton were in Tanzania. <coughs> And uh, there's some Rooney mania going on there. So what we want you to do, be our eyes and ears, please. If you've gone along to see one of these friendlies, wherever you are in the world, uh, do get in touch next week um, and or text us any time of the week or email up all night at bbc.co.uk. Don't text, actually. Email up all night at bbc.co.uk any time during the week if you've seen um, one of the English or British teams over your side playing a friendly. Uh, tell us what you thought of it. It'll be uh, really interesting. Maybe we can focus a lot more on that in, in next week's programme. Quick question for you all. Remember, it's a quick fire round. Richard in Oxford says, who's the breakout star from your respective disciplines and regions? Uh, Tim first. Well, we're running out of time, so I've got to tell this story. The breakout star is Cristiano Ronaldo. Uh, and uh, a second division club in Peru, Union Huaral, outskirts of Lima, tiny little club. They announced officially on Twitter this week that they have uh, they've been in contact with Real Madrid's president. They've been in contact with Jose Mendes, his agent. But they regret to inform everyone that they, they have given up their bid to sign Cristiano Ronaldo um, <laughs> because their coach has said it's no longer priority reinforcing that. We, we've suffered some injuries in other positions, so we have other priorities. So we are no longer interested. They've officially announced they're no longer interested in signing okay. Cristiano Ronaldo. Okay, this, 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 will come to, it, it, this, this will come hard, I think, okay. to the club supporters I'm because sure. uh, Lionel Messi has just renewed with Barcelona as well. Okay, so I don't well. know where, 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 where are they going to get their players from. And, and Paul, which is a breakout star in Europe for you. Well, I mean, how, how do you follow that, to be honest? Well, very <laughs> said, quickly, if you don't mind. <laughs> two and a half years ago that a young player called Sally Uchan at Fenerbahce would yeah. be the breakout player. He went to Roma for two years on loan, didn't kick a ball, but he's back at Fener, and yeah. he's back with a manager that knows him and that brought him through and that loves him, and he is going to have a breakout the year this year. And breakout star of the Women's European Championship... Jen? Well, this is a sort of slightly different slant, I guess. Uh, Vela Barsley is 29. She made her debut April of this year for Scotland and she's going to the Euros now. She plays a football in Sweden and she's 
probably Scotland's best player on form at the moment. She's a big centre half. She was born in England, yeah, so yeah. that's a miss for England. Um, I'm so pleased for her and, uh, and watch out for her. And I'm glad you brought in the Scottish football as well. Phew, that saved me. Uh, very quickly, Tim <laughs> and Paul, uh, her, what, what's Jen's Brazilian shirt name? Jordi Best. Jordi Best, yeah. Jordi Paul, Best. Paul, are you happy with that? Uh, yeah, go on then. Jen, you are Geordie Best from now on. Have a great time at the Championship and we'll report from there with you, I hope. Thank you very much.